couple months, and basically nothing worked. And gave him this D1 drug that I developed, and the monkeys, the monkeys got up, ate a banana. I mean, and it was unbelievable. So we actually ended up starting a company. I was a co-founder of a company with a fellow named Richard Mam, and we started a company to try to commercialize these D1 drugs because we believe they would continue to work in Parkinson's long after other drugs fail because those D1 receptors are still there. And in fact, they're sensitive because there's no dopamine in the body. And you could give these drugs and they would directly activate those receptors and we could keep Parkinson patients walking for a lot longer. But <clears throat> um, for technical reasons, the venture capitalists would come in and, oh, that's really interesting. And uh, but they would just walk away. I've had people come to my office. I've showed them a video of this monkey. A guy, a guy from the hospital was doing research in Parkinson's. I showed the video of this monkey getting up that had not been able to get, been more, but not been able to get up for a couple of months. And he said, oh, my God, why isn't this stuff in the clinic? So well, you know, can't tell you. So we pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and uh, never could get anybody really to bite. And then it turns out that there's a strong body of data that suggests that if you activate dopamine D1 receptors in the cortex, you can improve working memory and cognitive abilities. And in particular in schizophrenia, that's one of the big areas that they can't treat. They can stop the voices in the head that tell you to kill people and they can, you know, they can treat the positive symptoms. But these cognitive deficits, there's nothing that works there. So we said, well, there's a much bigger market there and maybe we can we can develop that. So we actually tried to develop that and get people to bite in that and it's a it's a, a situation where the drug companies and the investors are so afraid to lose money. There's no proof or principle. No one has shown in humans that activation of these D1 receptors improves working memory and cognition, so until somebody proves it, nobody wants to invest that money. So um, there are some studies now looking at that um, in humans and uh, if those prove out, then we will have shown, okay, they do work here. And I think there's a lot more money to be made there. And if that field would start developing, I think then people would go back and say, well, you know, these things would be good for Parkinson's, and we know they're good for this other thing, so let's... So maybe there would be some interest there. I, I still am convinced that a dopamine D1 receptor agonist or stimulant would be optimal therapy for Parkinson's disease and would continue working long after the present therapies don't work. But we just have not been able to get any drug company or investor group interested enough to buy into that idea to develop it further. So that's sort of where it stands. The schizophrenia trials will probably be done next year and we'll find out whether it worked. Maybe we'll find out if it worked in improving working memory and cognition. And I mean, if that works, at least, boy, there's a lot of schizophrenics out there who could be, you know, could have jobs and take care of themselves if, if they could, you know, if their working memory was, was functioning. So that would be a great thing. And I'm hoping that comes true. Switching gears, let's talk about evolution, the locus Coelius, and Peter Webster's theory. The locus Coelius, evolution, well, I don't think there's anything that, that we can do here that's going to change the course of our evolution because there's really no selection pressure, in my opinion. We've taken all the selection pressures off. People born with genetic defects and handicaps, etc., cetera, um, premature babies, all, all these uh, individuals that would have died in the past, the selection pressure is gone now. So I don't know that there's any selection pressure to direct our evolution in any particular area at all. I've had some dialogues with Peter. I'm not sure. He he places a lot of emphasis on the locus ceruleus, um, and I don't I haven't read his most recent stuff to know how far he goes. The locus ceruleus, as nearly as I can determine, is one of those areas in the brainstem. It's responsible for releasing norepinephrine on, on the cortical cells. All the norepinephrine in the brain comes from the locus ceruleus. Um, it normally is firing um, uh, in uh, when you're awake. It's firing at a you know fairly regular rate. If something novel happens in the environment, there's a burst firing that takes place that calls your attention to that. Um, and um, psychedelics keep those keep the locus ceruleus firing. Um, normally, when you go to sleep, the locus ceruleus stops firing and shuts off the release of norepinephrine into cortical areas. So psychedelics keep that keep that turned on, but beyond that, I don't know. Peter attaches a lot more importance to locus ceruleus um, than I do. I think it's important, but I don't know that it has the kind of importance that, that he attaches to it. If you have a specific idea or question, I, I could probably try to address it. But 
Well, I was just wondering more of your thoughts regarding evolution specifically. We'll we'll separate out the Ulysses, Ulysses Ergot thing for a moment, but I just wanted to talk about his his notion of sort of modifying and bringing more up to date Terence McKenna's psychedelic evolutionary theory. Yeah, I I, I just have problems um, really connecting any evolution with things that are happening in the brain. They're, you know, it's uh, Lamarckian transmission of acquired characteristics was sort of disproven, but now we do have epigenetics. So people, their DNA does change based on methylation of DNA, but in terms of, you know, evolution of consciousness or something like that, I, I don't know that I see the selection pressures for anything like that happening. You had looked into some of the Ulysses Ergot theory and being a, a chemist who has the legal ability in the United States to produce LSD. What are the issues related to Peter Webster's theory? Well, when I went to the Hoffman 100th birthday celebration in Basel, he had an idea that um, the the potency of ur urging, which is lysergic acid amide, was related to conformational changes in the top ring of LSD flipping back and forth. And I basically said, you know, that's that's complete nonsense. And he is a little bit upset by that. He says, well, you know, you can't say that. What do you mean? Why? And <clears throat> um, and the basis for that was we had a discussion. Um, if you hydrolyze ergon alkaloids under mild acid, they will hydrolyze down to give urging lysergic acid amide, uh, which just has an NH2 instead of a diethyl amide. That's the material that's in Morning Glory Seeds, for example, Hawaiian baby wood rose. And he said, you know, that's urging is not the same as you know this. The, you know, it's got to be more potent than that. It can't you know it can't just be urging. There has to be some other factor involved. So we had a discussion about could they have taken ergot and hydrolyzed it to ergine and what are the conditions under which that could be done and decided it could have been done. Maybe that was what happened. But he didn't think that ergine was, was really potent enough, that there must be some other thing that involved the conformational flip of the D-ring. And I really, in terms of receptor basis for that or pharmacological basis, I, I couldn't see any rationale for it. And I said, you know, I, I just can't can't buy that. It doesn't make any sense to me. And the discussion was kind of left there. I don't know what he actually did. He was kind of kind of reluctant because he thought it was a neat idea, but from a pharmacology chemistry perspective, it just didn't make sense to me that this D-ring flip would allow it to bind in some way that, you know, produced activation receptors that was different from the normal. I mean, if you look at ISO-LSD, it's just inactive. LSD is active, and and the polymerization, the switch in those, in those rings doesn't occur uh, that easily, but uh, there's no basis in my mind for thinking that you know that conformational ring switch uh, was responsible. And, and I think in front of the audience where he was, where there was extreme chemical naivete, it was pretty. He had some. Ni he, he gave a nice presentation. He's very articulate. I like Peter a lot. But and the audience was willing. You know, they're pretty open-minded. You can imagine that audience is pretty open-minded about anything. But in front of a in front of an audience of chemists, I think they would have crucified him. So I, it's interesting. I mean, I like these dialogues because, for example, I hadn't thought until Peter told me, I hadn't thought about the possibility of hydrolyzing ergon alkaloids in acid to give urgine. Because we always just hydrolyze it in base and hydrolyze all the way down to lysergic acid. He said, no, no, there's these papers. And you know, what's the mechanism? And he and I and um, uh, old Daniel Perrine at Loyola had a dialogue about what would be the mechanistic basis for how this happened to give urging. So it was a very interesting intellectual discussion, and I think probably it is possible. And we talked about, you know, suppose uh, in it, at, back in those Eleusinian mysteries in Eleusis, you know, suppose they had, how could they have done that? Okay, well, they could have taken ergon alkaloids and taken wine at a term to vinegar, old wine, which happens very quickly in the Middle East, could have gently hydrolyzed and heated them up in there, and then neutralized it with, say, wood ash, which has, you know, uh, potassium carbonate and potassium hydroxide, and then throwing in some honey and stuff to sweeten it up. So we could figure out how you know how you could get to from ergon alkaloids to ergine and get it into some kind of a form that might be something you could drink that would be acceptable. So I, that that kind of discussion was really interesting. 
but you know, we don't really know what was in that uh, kaikion. Other than, you know, we don't even know there was ergot in it. I mean, we know it had barley, and it sounds like they had an all-night religious experience. And you know, the formula for it was used for, for for parties for some hundreds of years afterward before the thing completely ceased. So there was something there. But you know, in those old days, and I, as as they pointed out in the book. Uh, wine was very different in those days. It wasn't wine like we have today. You went to a strong party, wine, strong wine, and they could have atropine in it, and they could have all kinds of stuff in there that produced a powerful intoxication. And you wanted to really get your guests as high as possible without killing them. So, <laughs> uh, who knows what was actually in there? But you know, it was very interesting. But the, as far as his, his sort of D-ring flipping and all, I just couldn't buy that as a chemist. You know, and uh, Dr. Michael Ranella has a brand new book coming out that sort of uh, backs up and goes into more depth on uh, Dr. Uh, David Hillman's book, The Chemical Muse, that came out last year. And it seems that uh, the ancient Greek philosophers and everybody else in Greece were using a lot more drugs than anybody really formerly had any idea of. Yeah, I haven't read the, I haven't read those books, but it doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, when you think about, I mean, the wine, they were pretty chemically sophisticated. I mean, atropine and uh, hemlock, and they had a pretty wide pharmac- pharmacopoeia back then. And uh, you know, what do you do on weekends? There's no TV to watch. We can talk politics for so long, but I suspect they probably did. I think a lot of those societies use, use a lot more psychoactive drugs than we do today. And, we just tend to like dismiss it. Well, well, you know, it's not something we were taught, and you really had the search to find it. But you know, I think in all these old societies, there were a lot, a lot more psychoactive drug use than we imagine. I mean, wine doesn't keep that long. You know, without refrigeration and pasteurization, wine goes bad pretty fast. And so, and you know, you can't, you can't. The grapes don't grow 12 months a year. So, I suspect they were getting intoxicated on a lot of different things. What is the single most important concept that you would like listeners to take away from this conversation? That the study of consciousness using psychedelics as tools may be one of the most important endeavors there is, and yet it's probably the most neglected field. That's just thinking out loud. And I guess it relates to what I said earlier about the fact that there's only half a dozen you know, researchers seriously doing this in the world. I mean, I think it's really terrible. These things are, I think these drugs are so important. They have such profound effects that relate to so many different aspects of life, mental health, society, you know, aggression, how we see ourselves as people, etc. And just, you know, they're virtually being ignored. I hope the situation is changing slowly. And hopefully... This program and so many others out there are helping to facilitate that change and bring awareness to more academics and people out there. Yeah, we really need re-education. You know, the media blitz of the 60s, the Leary-esque stuff, really contaminated the public perception of these. So we really need to turn around so that people see these more as uh, as healing substances with the sacred nature, and, and not just uh, you know as drugs of abuse. We've just the thing is completely out of balance, and we need re-education to to get people of this generation to understand that these are important things that need to be studied. Do you have any websites or other information that you would like people to have? Oh, other than uh, going to the Hefter website, uh, we've got a few things there, and of course Arthur Hefter's biography is there. What is the Hefter website? www.hefter, H-E-F-F-T-E-R, dot org. And we'll have updates there, and, and we have a lot of papers that we've sponsored, research papers that are listed there. And It's not, it's not a, a wealthy website in terms of all kinds of information, but go there from time to time and you can see what we're up to. Dave, thank you so much for the wonderful and very enlightening interview, and I really appreciate your time today. Well, it's been a pleasure, and uh, I'm glad to contribute to the re-education of the masses, so to speak. 